Um, Damn, I can't try, hear you. Oh, try talking again. Talking again. Much better. Is that better? I can't hear you behind us anymore. Yeah, that's good. Okay, I think we're live. Anybody else want to confirm? Dun, 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 dun. Zoom gave me a little notice. Okay. All right, we are live. Okay, um, thank you all for joining, for watching this video. Um, this event is hosted by Soul Stories. If you are just uh, catching Soul Stories for the first time or just joining in, um, we host uh, a podcast that you can check out. We have storytelling events that have kind of turned into these live Zoom sessions, and we also do dialogue events. And we're focused on unpacking the human experience and hosting difficult conversations. Uh, we want to create connection, bring people together, and really, really excited to work with this team um, to bring Approaching the Unknown um, to you all. You want to go, Kristen? Yeah. Uh, thanks, Danny. Yeah, uh, I'm Kristen Wade. I'm a graduate student at the Anschutz campus in Aurora. I do genetics research, but I got connected with- I can't hear you behind us anymore. Yeah, that's good. Oh, sorry. I'm right. good? Okay. Uh, I connected up with Danny and Chelsea and Hamish and um, we had this, this particular live stream is kind of an offshoot of an event we hosted last December that some of our viewers may have attended even uh, called Approaching the Unknown Science Through Creative Expression. And the purpose was to take research scientists and pair them with uh, artists from the community and have them perform uh, joint creative uh, performances in front of a live audience, which is something that obviously scientists are not usually super comfortable with. But that was part of the point was to shake science, scientists up, get them out of their comfort zone um, and start building relationships with the community in a way that we don't often get the chance to do as researchers. And I know for everyone who went, it was really incredible evening and exceeded all of our expectations. Um, and we're actually starting that up again this year. So a little pitch, if there are any scientists or artists watching who are interested, in performing in this year's version, please message Soul Stories. We would love to hear from you guys. Um, this particular live stream, obviously approaching the unknown is very relevant for where we're at in the world right now. A lot of uncertainty facing us and what better way to come together and support each other than by sharing our stories. Uh, so that's kind of what this event is for. And we sought to find some more unique voices from the community that uh, those not in that group wouldn't normally have the chance to hear from. Uh, so that's kind of why we picked the groups that we did. Uh, and then I'm gonna pass it off to Hamish. He's our master of ceremonies for the evening. He's gonna lay out how this is gonna run. Hamish. Hey, thank you so much for that, Kristen. Um, so I'm Hamish and I've been working with Soul Stories for a couple of years now. Um, and I'm also a PhD student at Anschutz Medical Campus. So I've been quite heavily involved with the whole art and science approaching the unknown project. And so, just to kind of repeat, you know, a little bit of what Kristen said about why we're doing this kind of project today is we, as we were kind of discussing, you know, the next big event that we were thinking of hosting in the, in the same vein as a, the, as a creative project that we did last September, last December, sorry. Um, we realized that we were in a kind of unique position to bring artists and scientists who were having kind of unique experiences within the coronavirus epidemic kind of to the table to give, you know, to give voice to them. Um, and so tonight we're gonna to be having four guests that kind of each are interfacing with different communities in kind of unique ways. Um, and they're gonna just be sharing how the coronavirus may have affected them in ways that you might not typically think of. Um, and so, to, you know, to be, uh, and at the end, we're gonna have kind of a panel. And so there's gonna be an opportunity to kind of ask questions between the panelists. And, you know, if you have a question, feel free to put it in the Facebook chat whichever should be under the video right now and Kristen will kind of be checking on this kind of constantly at the end of each interview I can bring her in and she'll be able to ask the question directly to each panelist um, if you if you have any kind of questions to everyone as, in a, as a whole we'll probably save those to the end and have those on the panel um, 
So let's just get right into it. So our first guest tonight is uh, our guests tonight is um, Chelsea Ochoa and Bryce Mourinho, um, and they are they created the Howl and Moon Eight, um, which has been kind of a roaring success in Denver. And I was so welcome. Thanks Hi. So I yeah, just I'm glad to be here. Yeah, I'm so excited to have you here as well. So I congratulations on your interview with NPR. I saw it today. It was amazing. Oh, thank you. It was really fun. It's amazing how you sit down and do a two-hour interview and it turns into a two-minute clip. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was really cool and it was a lot of fun. I thought they did a really nice job on it. It was it was well orchestrated. So just for the people who are unfamiliar with Out of the Moon 8, could you just give a brief explanation of what you've created? Yeah, we basically just started a Facebook group. Uh, it's called Go Outside and Howl at 8 p.m and it went viral and so nowadays in a lot of parts of the united states and in some other countries as well we've got about um 100 countries or so that are in the facebook group and all 50 states represented and so in certain places around you can go outside and you'll hear people howling um and that's kind of where it started from it's from this facebook group that we started it's become a phenomenon yeah no it's incredible so I guess I was curious about what what do you think you've hit on with this group? Like, why is it so popular now of all times? I think um, there's a lot of factors going for us. I think at the time we started, there were some other movements happening in other countries with people going outside to clap, people going outside to sing, bang pots and pans. And um, when we started, I think we thought we'd get a handful of people out with us doing it. But I think the fact that it's uh, low ask all you have to literally do is go outside and howl at 8 p.m um the fact that folks are pretty available and obviously more so i think they need some form of cathartic release so i think those were the big selling points and in the excitement when people came to the group of saying like wow this could be a thing and thus from there like inviting everyone they knew or a lot of their friends to join and be a part of it yeah, I think a lot of people don't have outlets right now to express themselves. And howling is this kind of safe thing to do because it's it's not words. Um, and so nobody can tell you you're wrong about what you're saying or what you're feeling or anything like that. And you don't have to kind of be vulnerable in a lot of ways, but you can still express some of the energy that you might be holding inside yourself. One of the things I noticed when you kind of just browse your Facebook group is that there seems to be kind of mini movements within your how at the moon eight, I saw the kind of stream of people posting their kind of recovery stories. And I'm curious about, you know, why do you think your, your group is the place that that's become like a, a platform for? Well, I think part, a big part of it is there's half a million people in there. And then another big thing is that people dedicate their howls to different things a lot. Um, and so people, um, it, it kind of invites people to touch on some of their greatest pain and their greatest joys because people want to say what they're howling for. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think we kept it open-ended and um, though that was kind of a small thing at first, it, it's shown how there is just a plethora of reasons of what people are going through, whether it be um, unemployment or financial distress or just being cooped up inside all day. Um, so. I think that helped form some of these outlets. I mean, a recovery thread to me is in a far leap from people struggling to be home and be spending all this time by themselves these days. What do you think the future is for Howl of the Moon Eight? Do you think it's kind of not, you know, a phenomenon that's uniquely connected to the kind of quarantine and being stuck at home? Or do you think it's gonna, you know? The cool thing home? is like, that's an interesting question because we don't, um, I don't feel like we have a lot of control over it. Uh, it's like this thing that we kind of started and then it like grew a life of its own really fast. And so every individual person is gonna be able to make their individual choice around that. But we're still seeing things where people are saying for the first time ever they heard someone else howl or they howled for the first time. So it's still growing in some places. Um, but I, I imagine that when people feel a sense of resolve, then they'll probably stop. Um, it's kind of like, like a lot of people ask on the page, like, how long am I supposed to howl for? 
And there's no like right answer for that. You just do whatever you want, right? But you pretty much know when you're done howling. It just feels done. And I think that's how the thing, the movement's gonna end too. So do you think the end of, uh, we'll know the end of the quarantine when people stop howling? Oh, goodness. Um, I think it'll be interesting. I think maybe it'll be a slow die down if I had to make a prediction. I think a lot of people will be like, all right, we're done. No more howling. But I think some folks are probably going to be diehards and be like, I'm going to howl every night at 8 p.m. <laughs> the rest of my life. And um, their neighbors may be successful in shooing them away from that, or maybe they'll do it. <laughs> but but I think for the most part, once the quarantine is kind of ended, we'll, the, the howling will probably slowly dwindle away too. A lot of people have talked about the possibility of having a really big party and everybody gets to gal together once we can and howling. So maybe that'll happen. I would love it if that would happen. I just think it'd be so cool to get everyone together at a cool location and do a big howl in one place. It'd be a lot of energy in one condensed space, that's for sure. Yeah, that would be amazing. Do you, so kind of one final question before we go to Kristen is like, what is there anything particularly that you have learned about the community that you're in through kind of organizing Howl at the Moon that you didn't know about before? I feel like I've learned a lot about the internet. And I feel like in the internet land, it's the Wild West, it's the Wild West, it's a totally different culture. Uh, I have like an intercultural competency background, and I would consider it to be a totally different culture than the way that people behave in public. Um, and it, um, I think that people are a lot less sensitive on the internet, which I didn't expect at first. So when I first started monitoring the page and somebody would say something that was mean, I would be like, no, you can't do that. That's going to hurt their feelings. And then sometimes the person would respond laughing and I would be like, I don't, I don't know what's happening. Yeah. Like I can take them. Like, don't worry <laughs> yeah. about it. So. I think um, something I learned too is obviously you have kind of your low hanging fruit or topics that you expect to be controversial and cause fighting. But what I've learned from co-creating this group that asks people to go outside and howl at eight is people will fight about anything. Yeah. You can post the most mundane, innocent post and people will, I think at the stakes of kind of winning the internet in this, in this group, like find any reason to fight back or be contrarian on just about any topic they can. And there's also like a really interesting question that comes up around, should you fight on the internet? And is it productive? And people fight about whether you should fight as well. Which is also do you think, do you think sometimes it's a, a product of people kind of being a little more lonely during the quarantine and they just need to have a kind of interaction with someone on the internet and the kind of easiest way to do that might be starting a fight on your page. Well, I mean, a lot of people are also like, I've made some amazing friends on this page. I've never felt so supported. I got, I posted a thing about my dog dying and 500 people commented and I've never felt so much love and now I'm crying. Like there's a lot of positive stuff too. Um, but I think our friend, uh, Claire Haywood, uh, she actually was saying that she monitors uh, stuff on the internet for a living. And she w was saying that like, trolling is up very very high right now so i think it is a lot of people are online right now because they got yeah. nothing going on it's not a uniquely howl at the moon phenomena it's it's more than that yeah i think there's also maybe obviously a sense of just like venting mm -hmm. that's happening whether it's productive or not where people just want to go fight with someone mm -hmm get on with their day I, I remember a couple of years ago I was over at a 7-Eleven on Colfax and the guy in front of me in line goes up to the counter and they were arguing politics and the one guy was this was a few years ago and then one guy was like Obama 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 and the other guy was like well Bush well Bush well Bush and then he was like all right man have a good day you too brother see you later <laughs> <laughs> and they just went on their way and I feel like that does happen often on yeah, the page. Yeah, that I think that's like that cu like cultural difference is like that kind of thing is what happens on the page. It's kind of uh, the how kind of fits perfectly for that sentiment. I think you know. Mm -hmm. you yeah. Primal energy out. The other day, a guy was like, "I need to speak with an admin." <laughs> it happens a lot. <laughs> Where are these admins at? Hashtag admin. Where's the admin? <laughs> and then he's like, <laughs> I always feel 
like I'd be like called to the principal's office. <laughs> and then by the time it was like 15 minutes later, and I was like, "Hey, man, how can I help you?" And he was like, "Oh, it's cool. I smoke some weed now, so I'm good." <laughs> and I was like, "Okay." <laughs> so, do we have any questions in the chat that we would like to ask to Chelsea and Bryce? Uh, so far, the only question is, how do I win the internet? Uh, which is pretty open-ended. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I was wondering, so how many how many total interviews have you guys done about this page now? It's it's quite a few, isn't it? Yeah, but they always, like, even if they talk to you for 30 minutes and you say what you want to say, they always, like, cut it down to be, like, very tailored. So I yeah. really appreciate this kind of a conversation. Absolutely. Yeah, but we've done a lot of interviews. It's been really cool to see how many people have reached out and even early on to get like um, an email or a message from someone in New Jersey who's like, hey, I'm trying to figure out what's going on with this howling out here. And I was kind of directed your way. Um, so we've done a lot. There's been a lot of little satellite interviews for small papers and then some bigger ones as well. So Very cool. Um, I was also wondering, is there, so is there any question that you almost never get asked in these interviews that people wish, that, that you wish people would ask you? I think we appreciate being asked about the page, the group. Yeah, the culture of the group is very, uh, I think, an interesting topic. And um, I hope that somebody out there is noticing all of the propaganda that I'm spreading on the page about the origin of the page because we <laughs> have a bunch of fake stories <laughs> and posted them all over. Yeah. And I think people are believing them. There was a point where we, we accidentally put go outside in Joel at eight. And so Joel has since become like a big figurehead and kind of a demigod oh, no. of the Halloween group where we say, Hashtag remember Joel and things to that effect. So don't forget about Joel, guys. Okay, we did actually get a few questions. Um, I'll start with my dad from Virginia wants to know if anyone is howling in Richmond, Virginia. If you guys have heard of anybody there. There's definitely people howling in Virginia. And Richmond, if I'm not mistaken, is a college town, right? There's several colleges, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so probably. I would guess so. I would guess so. Okay, and then we also have another question from Franklin, and he wants to know if there's something that you have found super moving um, personally by being part of this Howl group. There was this one time this guy said, I've never felt more connected to humanity. Wow. <laughs> people have said a lot of stuff like that, actually, and that's really moving. I think I've had my share of frustrations with the page. Um, because as a moderator, you're kind of on the front lines, of course, for uh, front lines, buzzword. Um, but you're on the front lines of like seeing all the negativity that's coming off the page and stuff. But then I've had a lot of moments of realizing like how many people are connecting on the page in like through messenger and finding like minded people or different people and realizing that the group really does have an impact. Um, it's funny how my like mental state will be changed if like one night I'm deleting negative comments and the other night I'm improving like positive posts for the page um, to realize kind of like just the duality that seems inherent in just about everything about there being good and bad and just hoping that that good outweighs the bad. So, so in the final kind of two minutes of this segment, is there any kind of message that you'd like to give to all the people who are following the Soul Stories? Uh, stream at the moment i have a thought on how to win the internet <laughs> i've been writing a blog in my mind in my, my my like as i walk around throughout the day i think that to win the internet literally if you are you just like don't directly insult people and call them like like dickwads or something and then instead you actually like continuously bring up your facts and your argument in a logical way like people on the internet I think often just don't know what to do with that and it's a very great strategy I highly recommend being kind to people and um also I'm a huge fan of the rickroll so if you ever <laughs> just want to rickroll someone <laughs> And a very different answer than <laughs> yeah. just rickroll someone. Well, I think like I've had I've had conversations where I'm like talking in circles with people, like trying to support them, and you know, so a lot of people have reached out to us. I've had to call domestic violence hotlines wow. and.
deal with suicide conversations and stuff. And um, sometimes people are unreasonable to the point where I rickroll them. But other than that, I think uh, being nice to people on the internet is the way to win. Nice. Because people will copy your comments and repost them in other groups. Nice. So, so can I thank you so much, Chelsea and Bryce. I've really appreciated you having you on the on the stream and thank you so much for giving us your time. Um, and so now we're going to move to our next panelist, our next guest. Thank you. Uh, our next guest is Laura White, uh, and she is a PhD student at the Andrews Medical Campus. Um, welcome, Laura. Hey, thanks for having me. Um, and glad to be a part of Soul Stories today. Um, I guess you guys pulled me in here um, specifically to talk about a community that I have been involved in creating in the time since the University of Colorado Anschutz campus shut down, uh, which is a uh, community of junior scientists here in Colorado. Mm -hmm. um, we've created a journal club called Know Your Enemy, which is focused entirely on uh, COVID-19. The journal club is kind of like a book club for scientists, except instead of all reading the same book, we all read the same paper or scientific article, and then we get together and talk about it. In this case, we're getting together in Zoom chats like these because none of us are in the same place. Um, and so just like a book club, often when you get together, not everyone has read the entire book necessarily. Maybe some people didn't actually acquire the book at all. But if you have a good group of people, usually you end up having good discussion. Um, and so Know Your Enemy is mostly made up of PhD students and a few people who are at the next stage of training as academic researchers, uh, which is called a postdoc. And since I know a lot of the audience here might not be scientists as an analogy, I'd say that PhD students, you could maybe think of us uh, as, say, somebody who's done a few DIY like home improvement jobs and is starting out as a journeyman residential contractor. Um, we're in our first few years of training in like a really specific field that has a lot of hands-on work. It has a lot of knowledge that's gained on the job. Every problem is a little bit different. Um, and we're on this path where we're really gonna focus in one specific direction for the rest of our career. And so even like within biology, we all specialize in different areas. We may know different techniques. And typically as we move, we get more specialized. And so in this circumstance where uh, there's this pandemic, even though I'm an RNA biologist and SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus that causes the disease COVID-19 is an RNA virus, I have very little training in virology. So if my family members come and ask me things about COVID, it's often like if you called your cousin who's a plumber for advice about an electrical issue, right? Like they might have good advice. If they happen to know something about that, but just because they work on somebody's house doesn't mean they're necessarily gonna have that specific expertise that you need. And so we sort of felt like in this situation, maybe we should all be taking the equivalent of like electrical repair 101 yeah. as scientists. Yeah, so I think one of the questions that I like to open with is I think most people, you know, it's a pandemic, scientists should be very busy, you know, researching, you know, finding a cure for coronavirus. But actually, scientists have been incredibly disrupted. And I was wondering if you could just talk about how your, you know, day to day life has changed since the pandemic has begun. Yeah, I mean, I, as I'm, you know, because you're, you work on the same floor as I do, yeah. we shut down on March 16th. Um, as a campus. And for the most part, most of us have not been back on campus at all or very little. So people who work um, on uh, really long-term projects or projects that involve laboratory animals um, have been on campus a little bit more uh, to, because it's, it's important ethically and for the, the purposes of those long-term projects too take care of laboratory animals, even if there is a pandemic. So people who manage mice for experiments or, or long-term experiments have been on campus a little bit. Most of us are not allowed to be on campus at all right now. I would say the exception are folks who are working on coronavirus projects. And even then they're being very strict with who can be on campus and what types of research can be conducted. And we really don't have a specific opening date, they're targeting maybe having 25% of people back sometime in May right now. 
Uh, but yeah, it, that, that means that for those of us that do very hands-on benchtop science, as opposed to more computational work that can be done at home, a lot of our work is completely on hold right now. So are you involved in any coronavirus related projects or is your kind of your research is at a halt as well? My PhD thesis has nothing to do with the viruses at all. Um, but every now and then, just because uh, you know a particular technique or work with a particular organism, um, you know, somebody who works in a different area can come to you and ask about a collaboration and potentially doing a couple of experiments that aren't related to your specific research. And so last November, um, a virologist downstairs did ask me about putting a protein um, from a coronavirus, not this coronavirus, into yeast, um, which is the model organism that I work with, the same microorganism that we use for brewing beer or making bread, uh, along with lactobacillus bacteria that you're everybody's using to make their sourdough bread right now, including me. Um, but uh, so I do have a little coronavirus collaboration right now, um, but it's really not the focus of my primary research. So with the journal club that you've started that's kind of based around COVID-19, you know, obviously understanding the virus more is helpful, but what do you think of the benefit, you know, how is it, is it benefiting you to bring scientists together in this kind of difficult time, you know? Yeah, I mean, we've had a lot of interest. I think I, certainly there was more, everybody's a little bit zoomed out right now, I think, um, around our campus because every, we have a lot of different uh, activities where we would get together and talk about research or talk with our groups. All of our meetings have moved to Zoom. So week one, we had like 70 people pile in, many, many people had read the papers. Um, there was a, a ton of discussion and week one, we, we really were at the one-on-one stage. We read a review article about coronaviruses so that we understood some idea of what was going on with biology. We read the very first case report of patients who'd had contact with the wet market in Wuhan, China and came down with a pneumonia infection caused by a novel coronavirus. Um, and we're now moving into week seven and, uh, you know, we're still getting a dozen or a couple dozen people depending on the week and what we're talking about. Um, but it's been really good. I think it's it's been empowering as scientists because if you don't have a reason, there's a lot of things that you can read about this situation that we're in right now. And it's good to have a dedicated place to talk about uh, kind of uh, what's on the cutting edge of research and what, what relates to some of the questions that I work on or that other researchers are working on on campus. Um, and there really wasn't another outlet for that. Um, so I've been glad to provide one. So what kind of one more question before we go to Kristen to see if there's any questions in the chat, but I was thinking, you know, during this pandemic, the kind of, uh, we, you know, Anthony, Anthony Fauci has almost become like a household name is kind of like the leader of the National Institute for like kind of infectious diseases. I'm wondering if like how you perceive your role as a scientist is kind of changing during the course of the pandemic. Yeah, I think it's going to be really interesting for people at roughly our stage of our scientific careers, PhD students, um, in terms of, you know, where are we head with our careers? Uh, this is a question for researchers everywhere um, right now, because there's a lot of question about whether people are going to pivot some or all of their laboratory focus to working on the crisis of the moment. And it's a genuine question because, you know, often the, the timeline of the questions that we answer as academic researchers and the types of questions extends well beyond the point where we'll likely have a vaccine for this virus. But at the same time, this is such an unprecedented, at least in the past hundred years situation that in a way it's really motivating. Um, and for me, it uh, makes me think a little bit more about uh, infectious disease as a potential focus as I think about moving forward in my own research. Kristen, is there any questions in the chat that you'd like to ask? I don't see any questions at the moment, um, but I was wondering, so 
you know, something that we've talked about in our lab sometimes is with this pandemic and with this sort of pressure uh, to get results out and to, to move progress forward and in our understanding, um, there's a lot of quick science happening, which isn't necessarily bad because we need that speed right now. We got to keep pushing forward and, and trying to learn as much as we can as quickly as possible. But, you know, science is a very slow process for the most part. And, it, and we're, we're coming up to this, this threshold where we're meeting that, that tension between like peer review and, and, um, and actually getting stuff out quickly. So I was wondering if you've come across that either in your work or in the, the journal club. Um, I had any thoughts about how that's impacting us as a scientific community. Yeah, I mean, we had a lot of discussion and debate the, um, I think it was week two when we read a paper about the origin of the virus um, and yeah. uh, some of the computational and genomic work that has gone into analyzing the genome of SARS-CoV-2 and what its likely origin is. Uh, what, what species did it most likely uh, come from for the first human infection. And so we read one of the papers that speculated that it might have come from uh, the pangolin, which is a, a rare mammal, um, which does not, as far as I know, bite humans, unlike bats. Uh, and, and yeah, there was a lot of debate around that, and there's, there's a lot in the press. I think, I mean, a lot of the questions that most pressingly need to be answered are not the kind of questions that I or you guys focus on as scientists. They are things like what my brother-in-law cares about, which is, are people who are on immunosuppressants more likely to contract or die from this disease? And that's a thing where, you know, getting a quick paper out, I mean, there's a recent preprint from all of the New York City cases and New Jersey cases with some preliminary data. And that preliminary data getting out as soon as possible is really important to physicians right now. Um, yeah, but, no, absolutely. Uh, yeah, some of the more um, like speculative computational drug discovery papers, people have been having a lot more debate about whether it's useful to put out a, a more theoretical or speculative paper. Absolutely. Okay, we do have a couple questions. Um, Brian was wondering if, what are a few of the most useful or interesting discoveries that you've talked about during the journal club session? Is something that really stuck out to you? Yeah, I mean, a lot of things we've really, I, it's amazing how many areas, I, I have to explain this to my family all the time, how many areas of, of research that are fairly related to what I do, I know nothing about. Um, so uh, a lot of times, like the, I learned a lot the week that the immunology students went over uh, literally the 101 of what happens to the human immune system as far as we know, when this virus uh, infects people. Um, but they, but the immunology and microbiology students didn't learn that much that week. I think one of the most exciting things that I read about, um, although it, again, might not be relevant before we have a vaccine for this, this disease, uh, was week four we read about one of the preclinical drugs that's out there. So something that isn't even in clinical trials, it's not available. Uh, for medical use because there isn't enough safety or efficacy data uh, to support that its use in humans at all. It's only been tested in animals, um, but a really promising potential antiviral drug that could be taken orally to either be used prophylactically to prevent contracting COVID-19 or to reduce the severity or the du duration of infection. Um, and that was pretty exciting. I think that you know, the drugs that people are talking about right now are not going to be the drugs that we will ultimately use to treat this infection. They're just what we have right now. Remdesivir, for instance, is something that was developed and failed uh, as an Ebola treatment. Hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Thank you so much, Lou. Uh, you any more questions, Kristen? Or do you want oh, Chelsea, just wanted real quick to know what the general mood of the people you work with in your lab is like, are they stressed or have, are they having, as she put it, uh, dance parties in empty parking lots on campus? <laughs> I, I mean, I can only speak for a handful of us. I, it's a difficult time to be a scientist right now, honestly, because I have, 
I get a lot of value out of doing hands-on things. I can't do any of that in my everyday work. I was painting a door today just to have something to do um, <laughs> that wasn't reading papers or writing. Um, and, uh, you know, leadership decisions being made at a national level are not necessarily seem to be driven by the science. And that can be really frustrating when that is what you're seeing on a day-to-day -day basis and you feel like there's nothing you can do about it. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for sharing that. I want to take a quick moment just after this science theme discussion uh, to just throw out a pitch for our Approaching the Unknown Science Through Creative Expression event, um, which is when we have scientists like Laura, um, maybe you'll want to volunteer for this one next year, um, join up with local artists to produce a joint performance in front of a live audience. Uh, our event will hopefully be taking place in the winter. Um, we'll see how things go, you know, what the state of the pandemic is at the time, but we'll still be going ahead with the event. And so if you are a scientist or an artist who is interested uh, in participating, please message Soul Stories and let us know. We are going to be starting to look for applicants for that event. And it's, it's kind of transformative to participate in. So let's put that out there. <laughs> So thank, thank you, Laura, again. That was um, a really yeah, good talk. Thank you for being on. So we're going to have a um, panel at the end, so please stick around and maybe there'll be some more questions. But um, So our next guest is uh, Benjamin Dunning. Um, welcome, welcome, Benjamin. Um, Hello, thank you for having me. And so you're from the Denver Homeless Out Loud. Um, yes. Um, so I was wondering if, you know, for the people that aren't unfamiliar with what you do, I was wondering if you could just explain who you are. Well, Denver Homeless Out Loud, we're um, a collection of homeless and formerly homeless individuals uh, that are advocating for our rights. Um, uh, mostly because policy decisions seem to be driven uh, more on property value than they are on human safety. So what happens is a lot of people wind up outside. So we challenge a lot of that narrative. Um, and that's led do a few different things here in the city. The tiny home village is a direct res uh, a result of um, of our advocacy. In fact, we're part of the uh, Colorado Village Collaborative that that's a part of. Uh, the mobile bathrooms that are going on around down the city, uh, those, we were partly responsible for pushing that. Um, yeah, uh, we recently had a class action lawsuit where the police can't just take people's belongings without notifying them seven days before they sweep them. Um, and so, yeah, it's crazy, crazy the things we still have to do. Right, right, right. So so it's a lot of a lot of legislation, a lot of legal stuff, uh, a lot of rallies, court filings. Um, we're, um, um, I mean, we spend so much time out on the street talking to the homeless community um, and gathering what the homeless community says. I mean, everything's directed by surveys that we do. So um, when the camping ban first passed, when we first formed, uh, we did a survey and asked people, what do you think about this camping ban? Is it easier to get into the shelters or is it harder? Do you feel safer out there or not? You know, is it, are you getting more police contact or less? The answers are obvious. They were based on the warnings that were given by advocates from several other organizations. But, you know, it's, it's down in print, um, you know, and, and documented. Um, so... That is an example of one of the ways in which we gather data in order to direct what the kinds of things that we work on. So I guess I'm curious about what you've been kind of hearing during the kind of quarantine, because, you know, very naively, you know, the shelter in place is encouraging people to stay at home. And I'm not sure what you would do if you don't have a home to stay in. I'm curious about what the experience has been like. It's, you know, it's such a contradiction, the way the city is managing our homeless community. Um, one of the things that the CDC has warned us against is packing people together tightly in spaces. But the politics of the situation is, is our politicians, they don't want to see visible homeless people out there. Um, and they want, they want two things at the same time. They want to protect property, whether it's public or private, for private business investment, and they wanna hide the homeless. So the two ways that they hide the homeless is one, they scatter them, and two, they pile them into shelters. They don't build the needed housing because, you know, uh, we have a, a dearth of budget housing here in the city. Mm -hmm. 
and the developers refuse to build budget housing. Uh, they'll build government subsidized affordable housing, which is a replacement for budget housing that should exist uh, exist out there. So those are the dynamics. So COVID comes along and the city decides we're gonna pile everybody into a big shelter. Um, 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 we have all these empty hotel rooms and apartment buildings. And rather than um, treat our homeless, like this is an emergency, we need to get you inside these other places for a while until this passes. They basically just said, well, we're not going to run sweeps for a little while and you all pile into here where you can be infected. There's 170 infections of uh, guests over at the new big shelter over there at the uh, Western complex uh, and apparently 80 employees. So um, that's a lot of infection going on in that concentrated place. Do, do one of the things that one, oh, sorry. I was just gonna ask if like, whether you uh, are getting provided by the city like protective equipment as kind of employees or as. Well, you'd have to ask the people that are running the shelter on that. Um, they test the employee, they, um, they, um, they have been testing the guests, mm -hmm. taking a quick temperature check, mm -hmm. um, but they have not been doing that with the volunteers and the employees. Oh, no. So, I mean, so one of the things that the homeless community has done for decades, um, there's a portion of the homeless community that's uh, avoided these shelters, especially in the winter time during cold and flu season. They don't want to catch the yearly flu as it passes through. So people will find ways to distance themselves yeah. from concentrations of folks. So it's actually safer for our homeless community to be out on the street in tents, spaced apart and whatnot, than it is to be crammed into a shelter. And the homeless community is comfortable with this and they've known this for years. Um, uh, but it's something that um, property developers and the public officials that they buy don't like to see. Um, and so it creates a lot of stress. So for the past two months, most of these camps have police officers that drive by and are looking at them at the windows and that kind of stuff until a week ago Thursday um, when, they, um, when they swept over 200 people from the places that they were staying. Um, and they just picked up and went to a block um, the city claims that these places are, are dirty and that they're health hazards and they're disintegrating, which is not true. Um, one of the things that's happened with the homeless community is they've come together fairly strong and these camps are neat and organized. People are watching out for each other. You don't have trash around there. You might have one individual camp or whatnot that looks kind of messy. So, um, and they're, um, and they're learning for the first time. One of the things that we've struggled with at Denver Homeless Out Loud is to, get to, is to get people whose lives are so unstable because they're being moved around all the time or their lives are so restricted by the, um, um, by the schedules of shelters um, is, is to get a community like that organized and working together. Well, now that the community is more stable, more organizing is going on and you know, hopefully as a result of that, the community will be able to fight for their rights as a community uh, a whole lot better. So rather than a handful of four or five people, four or 500, four or 5,000, we'll see. But that's the kind of thing that's beginning to grow that's, uh, that's been a positive thing um, that's uh, been happening in the community that could pay dividends in the future. But at the same time, there's a great challenge. Uh, the um, So, as the mayor wants to open up early and the areas where their businesses are, he wants to push people out of sight. I guess um, you've had like a kind of troubled relationship with kind of like the city government, but I'm curious about what the relationship between the kind of homeless community and kind of the general public has been during this. You know, has there um, been a kind of outreach of sympathy or is it kind it's, of- more It's one about? of misinformation. Because what'll happen to the general public is when you educate people about what's really going on, they say, uh-uh, that's not true. So when you tell the general public that 60% of the people who are homeless have, 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 uh, have some sort of steady income and they're working, um, they don't wanna believe that. They wanna believe that everybody's a drug addict uh, because that's what they get told by the folks that have their eyes on the property value of that, um, of that data. They want to, um, you know, the number one, Thing that sends people homeless is um, is some sort of health issue. 
um, getting injured on the job, um, losing that job, and then not being able to keep up with rent. Uh, other major factors is the breakup of a major relationship, like a divorce or something like that, you know, job layoffs and that kind of stuff. Those are the major causes of homelessness. But people in the public eye, um, because our shelters, our first drug and alcohol recovery centers, they assume that that's the need. If you think about our shelter system, Salvation Army, their number one thing is a drug and alcohol recovery center. Uh, the Denver Rescue Mission, their number one thing is a drug and alcohol recovery center. Certainly they're needed in the community, but that's the only choice. <laughs> if you're gonna go into a shelter, then there's not housing on the other side. Housing wait list for affordable housing, you know, uh, two, three, four, five years out, depending on the situation. Um, yeah, that's tough. But so getting to the end of the this kind of segment, I was wondering, if Kristen, if there's any questions in the chat, uh, or if we had, you any, had any questions. Yeah, ask me questions before I keep talking, because I'm a, <laughs> a storyteller type. No, no, that's great. Um, this has been really informative. Uh, we do have a question, and Suzanne Wade, my, my aunt, <laughs> was wondering, um, are you, if you're seeing any increase in the population of homeless people during this time when people are losing their jobs or aren't able to pay rent, has that had a noticeable impact on the, the makeup of those communities? A little bit, but I think it's the, um, um, I think it's, I think it's the um, leading edge of what's coming later. Um, so um, there's a lot of people who have become homeless in the last couple, two or three months um, that that I'm aware of that that weren't before. Um, but in the last six weeks, what are there like 33 million now uh, unemployment applications with the feds? A lot of those folks are going to wind up out on the street. So come come October, about the time the weather changes, you know, and while they didn't evict people right away they evict them later because they're not doing any rent forgiveness yet these people are going to be out, stuck out on the street so um yeah I, I i shudder to think i'm thinking at least twice uh as many people visibly homeless out on the street but it's tough to know yeah. and that's in four months <laughs> wow. yeah yeah it definitely seems like the tip of the iceberg Sure. Have there been, um, have you had contact with homeless populations in other cities around the country? Is it looking pretty similar for them too? Exactly the same. What's amazing when it comes to homelessness and homeless issues, um, because the same entities own the local governments. I mean, our, our federal government is like owned by the pharmaceutical and the big oil guys and all of that. All our local governments are, are, are owned by property developers and real estate stuff. So it's the same tune everywhere in every municipality. Uh, they all wanna build buildings and none of those people that wanna build buildings wanna see poor people. So all the issues are the same from city to city to city. Their policies are the same. Um, you know, uh, the number of folks that are, uh, that are going homeless that are the same. Uh, the risks are the same in city to city. So, yeah, it's it's pretty much the same thing. We have some pretty close connections with um, some other organizing organizations in Portland and San Francisco and Los Angeles and Sacramento and a bunch of other places on the West Coast. And when we uh, when we get together on our Zoom calls and share information, we're hearing the same stuff from city to city to city. Uh, the other thing that we are seeing that's same from city to city to city is that when people say, "Hey," We can't just leave these folks out on the street and you can't cram them all into the shelters. How about the governor use his powers as governor and um, and um, and um, and put people up in hotel rooms and empty apartments, you know, commandeer some of that stuff during emergency times. Um, they have those powers. Our governor says that he doesn't have those powers when if you read the stuff, he clearly does, and they just choose not to do it. It's the same, the same, the same, the same, and it's national. So, yeah. So, in the, in the final kind of two minutes of this kind of segment, is there any kind of misinformation or misconception of homelessness that you'd like to kind of correct um, for people to take away? Uh, that the homeless person screwed up to become homeless. 
um, a homeless person wasn't at fault because they got paid $10 an hour for a job and they had to make rent for $1,500 a month. Um, <laughs> that, that's, that's the follow of people who are keeping all those other buildings locked up to keep the prices high. Um, so that's one of the misconceptions is that, I mean, um, it's our systemic problems and it's all housing. Um, and the other misconception is that some sort of job training program or some sort of training and building people up will solve homelessness. It will not. Housing will solve homelessness. People don't go to the obvious thing. So the misconception is, is if you fix the person, homelessness will go away. No, you got to build housing that people or reduce the cost of housing because people are working and, and whatnot and can go in and take care of themselves if we're just reasonable about it. Pay them enough and lower the rates on the housing. Yeah, so thank you so much, Ben. Uh, that was amazing, really informative. I'm so glad to have you on the, on the program. Um, and so our next and final guest is uh, Franklin Cruz. Is Franklin there? Hey, I Franklin. am. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty chill. I was enjoying all these conversations. Yeah, so you're, you're a local artist and educator. And so, what, you know, can you explain to people out there what you'd be doing if it wasn't foreign to now? Um, so I'm a poet and a dancer. I'm a MC. Um, I storyteller. Um, a lot of my work ends up taking me to performances around town, to different um, open mics or um, speaking events, different dance battles, um, different uh, events where they just need someone to be gracious on stage and entertain everybody and make connections. Um, so that's usually what I'd be doing. I'm also a science educator, so I would be working at the Science Museum, but currently we're closed. Our time. So how, how is kind of the, you know, the uh, quarantine kind of affected local artists and musicians is, you know, obviously there's no theatres are no longer open. Of, um, and it's hard to get a platform, but, you know. Yeah, I think um, coronavirus really exposed uh, how, like, um, ten, or how unreliable the gig economy is and how a lot of gig workers aren't protected in this economy. You know, they're just kind of left to their own devices. Um, and when coronavirus hit, most artist workers are gig workers. Like we live on the gig economy. And so we were completely disrupted by that. Um, I know many friends who every single source of income they had stopped immediately because dance studios were closed because schools were no longer in session and there was just no avenue anymore for us to make our money other than friends supporting us family supporting us and applying for relief funds yeah so like has has this become an opportunity to like maintain are people still being creative in this time or is it just a kind of battle to survive for these artists um, I think it just depends on what kind of resources you have available to you. I'm still able to be creative because, you know, for one, my family um, is able to help me out. And so, you know, I don't have to necessarily work about immediately or having, I don't have to necessarily work really hard to find an immediate secondary income, um, you know, because I do have the museum job to fall behind. And I'm in a unique position where I do have that capacity to be both the scientist and the artist. A lot of my artist friends do not have the capacity, like they dedicated their whole life to art. And so in this moment, I know many friends who signed up for the um, Grubhub dealings, the Uber drives, you know, going to grocery stores and applying because they just have no other option and they don't have any other support in their life to um, get them there. Uh, that being said, though, there has been a whole host of artists who um, have stepped up. Uh, I know I've done free workshops. Um, the how movement in itself is an art um, as well. Um, personally, I've also done two or three other shows. I did one called a song association show where I got Denver musicians to send videos or to call in on a Zoom call. And we essentially gave them this game and recorded the game and then uh, published it out for everyone to see. Did a similar thing with the first ever Denver Digital Slam, had poets submit poems and then did a whole slam online. Um, and then recently just did the, a project I called the Montbello Drive with Soul Train. Um, I just put uh, a drive or a DJ in the back of a truck and drove him or drove her around all of Montbello just to play music for people. 
Um, on top of that, I've known on Instagram, you can pretty much learn anything right now. You, I've taken uh, b-boy classes. I've taken Italian classes. I have taken so many things because artists are stepping up and saying, you know what, regardless of money, people need to connect. People need to feel something. People need to express. And for those who had the resources within their capacity to like offer that to people, they really stepped up and, and did that for everyone and just presented themselves in a way that was just for community, no money. So kind of building on that, like, you know, social justice movements have kind of historically kind of often fermented in kind of artist communities. And I'm wondering if you're noticing among your kind of the artist community in Denver, whether the themes that people are like kind of approaching is changing in relation to coronavirus, whether this is kind of giving people different, uh, different things to attack, if you will. Yeah, um, the things I've noticed specifically, um, a couple of ones, I've noticed a real big return to um, the like intrapersonal or the intrapersonal, like what really motivated you as an individual to be an artist. I've seen a lot of artists go back to their like origins and their like um, originating motivations, but I've also seen a lot of artists who have started tackling um, the disparities that coronavirus just exposed even more. Um, artists who are, essentially like creating for the purpose of making funds to give to others, right? Artists who are like, hey, yo, I'm doing this whole show. I don't need the money. All the money will be uh, given to these families in my immediate community or this group who's immediately doing this. Um, so a lot of people are creating from that sense of like, you know, they know that the world is hurting and what they can provide um, not only will heal the world in itself, but will also um, get them resources that they can give out to other people. Um, and the other one that I'm seeing a lot too is this like visioning world because this disrupted so many systems and um, the environment, the economy, our politics. Um, a lot of people are like, you know what? This world is so messed up. What would a good world look like? You know, what would the best world look like? And then painting that, writing that, dancing that, singing that, and really envisioning it and trying to manifest it and say, you know what? I can create this world with my poem. Why can't we create this with policy? on that for you know further you know it looks like the quarantine maybe it's gonna end soon maybe it's gonna wind up a little bit but i think our ability to kind of congregate at venues on mass is going to be a challenge and i think that's obviously going to affect the artistic community moving forward so my, i guess i'm curious whether you, what you think is going to happen to kind of what directions the artistic community in them is going to take over the next six months to a year you know yeah um so for one i know larger organizations are going to be fine. It's like, you know, the tier one cultural institutions, the DCPA, the art museum, all of that. Um, I think for the most part, they'll be okay. I think for me, looking at the future, I am concerned about, you know, your curious theaters, your Mercury cafes, your, your smaller venues, who, in my opinion, are the true cultural hub, because not all of these artists get to go to the DCPA, get to go to the Denver Art Museum. Like, those are very exclusive areas. And so, um, without these venues, I think people have started to become more creative. I mean, me driving around with a DJ Mambello, that was my solution to not being able to get next to people, but still wanting to be an artist. I know Warm Cookies of the Revolution and other local Denver art groups, they're doing virtual um, uh, care packages for, of art. You know, they'll send you paintings and photos of paintings and poems and songs done by a whole bunch of Denver artists just because you're having a shitty day, you need to pick me up. Um, Another one I know is Bobby Lefebvre, Susie Q. Smith, and Carrie Joy, three local, very wonderful poets, are pretty much doing like guerrilla poetry where they go and they will just take over a whole section of a building or a sidewalk and just post poems that you could just walk by and people going on leisurely strolls through the neighborhood can just take a poem. And, you know, there's no one there. They've been disinfected. They're out in the sun. UV rays have completely like killed off everything. Um, and so it's just kind of like, okay, this is a little bit safer than having to pack an entire open mic together. And that way we're still sharing poetry. We're still sharing stories. Um, I know the whole TikTok dance thing, a lot of people may not like TikTok, but, you know, I've now seen entire countries, you know, share different dances, share different traditions, share different practices. And um, it's unified a lot of people in the dance world, in the poetry world, everywhere. So, you know, it's, it's a lot. So last five minutes, Kristen, do you have any questions from the chat for Franklin? Um, no, not so much questions, although we do have a really 
um, comment that really hits home from Juliana is saying that this kind of thing really shows us how fragile we are as humans and that this is when union between us is most important. And I think that that's a really um, important role that art is serving right now, um, as Franklin was saying, to, to connect people in these times when we really need it. Um, I was wondering if there's some, um, I don't know, a repository or online resource or even just how to search on Facebook to support local artists um, for people watching if they want to to provide some kind of either just viewership or, or monetary support for their local artists. How do they go about doing that right now? What's the best way? Um, yeah, so I know many different organizations have um, COVID artist relief funds. Um, I know there's a couple of GoFundMes done um, in Denver through local artists. I'm trying to think of, I can't think of their specific names. Um, I can try to look them up and then in the panel. Um, give those resources out that you can donate directly to. I'm much more for the, just find the people who you know personally, who you know haven't hit a big yet and send them 10 bucks on Cash App, send them $10 on Venmo. You know, um, not only does it actually financially support them, but it also demonstrates that like people still want you to do your art even after all this is done. You know, and that as an artist is inspiring to say like, you know what, I can't let this go. I know this is super treacherous right now, but you know, my art does do things for people um, in ways that I may not understand right now, but have faith. And that would be a good like demonstration of faith to be like, I have faith in you. Please don't give up on writing or in singing or dancing. Yeah, no, absolutely. Thank you. So just for the last final few minutes before we move to the panel, um, are there any projects that we should look out for that you're working on at the moment? Um, that uh, Yeah, so, um, the two that I'm gonna continuously do are the Denver Digital Slam. Um, and that is going through the We Are Denver Network. Um, you can uh, just pay attention through them and we broadcast uh, on their platform. And then the other one is if you are in the Montbello area, I will still be continuing to do the Montbello Driveway Soul Train, um, partnered with not only the councilwoman for this district, but also a couple of Montbello organizations to um, Make sure we provide resources for people like rent assistance, food, education assistance, um, and then distributing that information through the driveway DJ so that people who aren't aware or don't have access can then get access. Thank you so much, Franklin. And I think that is the end of our first section. So thank you to all the guests. Um, it's been amazing. Thank you so much. Um, so we're now going to move to kind of a panel section. So just to begin, is anyone of our guests would like to ask a question to another one of our guests or would like to throw out a question to, in general? We actually had a leftover question from the feed that we didn't get a chance Sorry. to ask for Benjamin. Um, let's see, uh, Brian was wondering if there have been any recent efforts to construct or renovate property to increase affordable housing options, if, if there's just any effort of that underway right now at all. Not to scale. Um, uh, the uh, Colorado Coalition does the best it can with the uh, minimal resources that it has. Uh, most recently, they purchased a hotel in order to get cheaper housing in the affordable range, but they run into roadblocks. If you guys remember a couple of years ago in Lakewood, uh, when the uh, federal center over there was uh, selling off some land, uh, the local government there prevented them from acquiring the land by federal guidelines when the feds give up land and they decide they're gonna sell it to the public, people who build um, um, affordable housing are the first ones to have access to it. They neglected to advertise it. We're ready to sell it to some business developers. The coalition found out about it, said, no, 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 we need to be offered it. And then it just got all screwed up the whole way along. So they run into huge challenges to do what they do. So, you know, there are willing organizations if, you know, certain entities would get out of the way. And what happens as a result, what we need isn't getting built. Although the people who could make those changes will tell you different. They will tell you they're trying hard. Um, we have a 1.2 or eight or something million, a billion dollar budget here in Denver. 40% uh, of it um, uh, goes to, uh, Health and health and safety, um, and of that, twenty-one million dollars is set aside for for homelessness and housing. Um, we've spent over thirty million dollars 
uh, just getting 140 hotel rooms um, through the city that they just did as part of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, so you, they are not operating to scale and that's unfortunate. Although mm -hmm. some things come out there. Cool, okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, it's it's eight. Do you guys wanna you guys wanna howl real quick? Yeah, can we howl together? <laughs> One live stream, come on. <laughs> In my I'll neighborhood, down, not only down. do they howl, they also shoot off fireworks or something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I have heard That's those. Good. Although I think Chelsea and Bryce have strong feelings about the fireworks. No fireworks. <laughs> no fireworks. That's my speech. I'm only reporting what I hear. I don't do either. <laughs> uh, do we do we have any questions that anyone's interested in asking or? Uh, yeah, I mean, I have a question for um, Benjamin. Um, in terms of like the direct companies who have the most sway um, in pretty much getting first dibs or getting things uh, offered to them instead of it going through the appropriate guidelines and making sure that um, affordable housing gets access to it first, like who are these people? Like, is there letters we can send, campaigns, like things to say or just to support and say, you should not be prioritizing your development, we should be prioritizing the development of resources it's for those who are actually need. It's not specific companies, it's collectives. It's the real estate lobby. So when you think of the Downtown Denver Business Partnership, that's not one company, that's a collection of companies. And what happens is, is they, uh, they will direct things that way. Um, um, so, and so they will push politicians, organizations like that, that are collections of companies, um, so that they can hide like, oh, it wasn't this particular guy. Although I'll mention the name Walter Eisenberg and Sage Hospitality, who's a big influence in that way. But guys like him get to hide behind these other organizations where like, well, the whole business community wants this. They will push projects in directions that, aren't, that don't meet the need. Uh, a good example is there is a project that is being built off of Arkansas and Colorado Boulevard. It's 850 units, uh, 170 of them are going to be affordable, which is about 17% of that housing, which is going to be affordable. The rest of it's market rate. That's in a city where 87% of the renters in Denver make $35,000 a year or less. So that project shouldn't have been 17% affordable. It should have been 90% affordable with the rest market rate. So it's inverted. And the... And the politicians who were approving the project, they were celebrating, oh, 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 there's going to be a little bit of affordable housing in this project. And so, but they get pushed by, you know, um, um, yeah, so I can re-explain it again, but we're pressed on time. <laughs> I was just wondering if, um, I know people had reflected at all during this, this time of sort of the, the most surprising challenges maybe to come out of this, this pandemic and the things that you find yourself doing. Like I, I did never expect myself to be doing this. <laughs> I don't know if anybody had experiences like that, but I've definitely found that wearing sweatpants to work every day was not something that I anticipated happening. <laughs> Today I was uh, with my niece and we were running around in the park and I, she's two and a half years old and uh, I pick her up and I carry her around all the time. I usually babysit her once a week and I cannot touch her or hug her right now. And so trying to have a conversation with my niece to explain to her why I can't pick her up and why I can't hug her and why she can't come close to me is something I never thought I would have to do. Mm. Okay. On the flip side, though, is there anything that, like, the experience of the pandemic and coronavirus and stay at home, you know, uh, any positive things that this has shone shot light on in your community that you hadn't noticed before? Um, I know for sure um, in my personal community with my family, um, we've had to really address a lot of communication things and it's brought a lot of healing to our family. 
uh, mainly because we did, had no option other than to be with each other, all of us. And it's uh, seven people in this house, um, you know, and like it's an intergenerational house. We have people who are um, close to 16 and we have a two year old, right? And everything in between. And having to reconnect with who we are now as these individuals and not who we were before in our new stages, our new developments and having to relearn everyone all over again. Um, I'm really hoping people do that in their homes. Like it's been very healing for me and my family to reconnect in those ways and be like, oh my God, you no longer think like that. I shouldn't treat you like this anymore then. And having that be like, oh my God, I've been treating you like this this whole time. That's so not fair. <laughs> and then those ref deep reflections being like, my God, I'm so glad we had this conversation. Like, let's not do this anymore. <laughs> yeah, think, yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, just kind of jumping off that family communication thing. Um, I know for myself and a lot of other scientists, uh, one of the fairly common aspects of training as a scientific researcher is that you move. And you move sometimes a really long way away as our moderator can uh, testify to from uh, where you grew up or where your family is. Um, and the communication can be fairly challenging um, because of distance or time differences or whatever. and and. Uh, everybody being stuck at home has meant that I've been more in touch with my uh, broader community of uh, family, acquaintances from 10 years ago, everyone that I emailed in the middle of March and said, if you are in charge of planning a large in-person event in the next month, no one's going to tell you that you should cancel it. So I'm telling you right now, you should cancel it. Um, and uh, it's been it's been nice in some ways to kind of uh, bring some of those relationships to the forefront and prioritize them in a way that is just a little bit easier because everyone's saying home. I've had something a little different happen to me. Um, Traveling to meetings in different parts of the city is difficult when you don't own a car and you ride a bike and you're getting older and all that walking stuff uh, becomes a challenge. You know, a 20 minute bike ride is now a 35 minute bike ride and uh, showing up to places all disheveled and stuff. Um, since the pandemic, uh, since everybody's meeting via Zoom, I'm able to get to a lot of places that, uh, <laughs> that I didn't have access to before because of my I'm aging, my physical limitations. And so I found that, I find that kind of interesting. Um, yeah, jumping off that, it's been cool to host these Zooms like every Thursday through Soul Stories because I feel like Laura, Benjamin, Franklin, like often, like it's just given me an opportunity to meet and experience people in ways that I probably wouldn't get to experience if we still had to put the appointment on the schedule, get to the place, like, um, yeah, it's been cool to just connect with different people because the internet is the space to connect now. The other thing with me is uh, for Denver Homeless Out Loud, we, we hold an office space, um, but there's only one person that spends most of his time there in the office in order to make it available for uh, folks out on the street to come by and share information and stuff. And that's me. And that's part of the reason why a lot of these other uh, connections that I can't get to because I wind up being holding the office space down while everybody else is scattered everywhere else. Um, so that's been, hopefully I can get somebody else to sit around and receive phone calls. And, <laughs> and uh, a lot of times when people are just passing through, um, they get the same answers because they have the same questions. <laughs> yeah, it is interesting in the scientific community too. Um, as Laura was saying, we've been communicating exclusively over Zoom for the most part. And interestingly, I, I feel like I've developed better communication with, with my, my mentor, my boss as well through something about in-person meeting that's just a lot more room to feel like you have all the time in the world and like you can just chat and like lose track of focus and it's like 
no, okay, we, we actually have goals and we, we're going to do that and then get off Zoom because we've all been on it all day. <laughs> so I've, I've found it helpful for um, being more specific in, in communication uh, with, with people in a way that's helping with research move forward. <laughs> yeah, I've had to be because uh, my advisor is homeschooling his children because his wife is a doctor, so. There you go. <laughs> On the kind of flip side, like communication is getting better. I'm, I'm wondering, you know, I've spent a lot of time alone, which is a lot of time with myself, which is kind of an interesting to have to be kind of forced to spend time. There's know, no escape in a yourself. way that maybe when you're in a kind of busy life, you don't always have to. And I'm curious about whether you've kind of had any of these experiences as well. You mean you mean existential crises? <laughs> maybe an existential crisis or two, you know. <laughs> Uh, I can talk on that. Um, one of the ones, so I'm pretty ambiverted. I feel very comfortable being by myself um, and being out in public. But one of the things that I really found myself craving, which um, I like, I love to dance. I'm not gonna lie. Um, was actually just dancing, but with people. Like, um, and it wasn't like, oh, that was fun. No, like there was times where I would be depressed because yeah. I hadn't danced with people in a very long time. Yeah. And it was interesting to me, like how healing that nonverbal space was like to really just be in a room with people who I don't know, not going to share names with, not even going to talk to, but just being able to like get on a dance floor and have 30 people all share that space together and all engage in that same thing was something I didn't know how profound of an effect it was on me. It's a very particular type of human connection that's very hard to recreate in any other context. <laughs> I do think that there's a lot of really healthy things happening um, and a lot of healthy behaviors that people are exhibiting, um, at least for those who are privileged enough to be spending more time at home. I feel like it's a lot of people around me are slowing down a lot, becoming more connected with nature and uh, becoming just more connected with their own thoughts. And it's a much healthier pace of life than what the American standard is. So my little fantasy is that after this, nobody's willing to work five days a week anymore and we all go to four days a week. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like the dream right there. <laughs> it really is going to force uh, a lot of different sectors to evaluate if people need to be in person at the very least, um, whether it's universities or my spouse, for instance, is uh, used to work one day a week at home. And our bet right now is that his company will no longer have an office a year from now um, because they were really well positioned because everybody worked from home Fridays to start just moving everybody to full-time work from home. Um, but, you know, the people that, are delivering things to people's houses. And my close friend who's a nurse and those of us who work bench top science, two different degrees, don't have the ability to do that. Um, and so it's it's gonna be interesting how this cuts across different, yeah, sectors of society and different levels of privilege and a number of different axes really. I think we're kind of entering the kind of final 10 minutes of this panel. So are there any questions on the chat? No, no, not really. <laughs> I guess I've got like kind of maybe one final question for kind of everyone, which is, you know, a lot of things have changed because of this coronavirus pandemic. If there's any of these changes that you would hope might stick around and things hopefully get better, you know, what would they be? You know, any, any, any strong, strong feelings? Yeah, I can jump in. Um, I think something, I feel like before this, I used to live my life tired. <laughs> like it was come it was go to work emotionally exhausting job come home work out like do my normal routine and then like work on my creative projects um and because there's such a life has just felt not life but like so much of like the creative work has felt on pause in some way I, I just feel less tired and more willing to connect. Chelsea, Bryce, and I are quarantined together. Um, and it's just, it's just really nice to be able to like enjoy the people around me instead of being like as hyper focused on things as I would have been in the past. So I just enjoy the feeling of relaxation. And I think I 
need to carry that with me as I go forward. I'm hoping one of the things that um, happens as a result that uh, people feel less of the need to be busy. Um, there's a lot of times where people will do things because, oh, they'll think I'm lazy if I'm not doing something at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, and I think with the pandemic, people are realizing like, no, <laughs> you don't have to fill every second of your day with something that's leading towards something or shaming yourself if you hadn't. I mean, we see this in a lot of our systems. Um, you know, the police coming by and bothering the homeless all the time. They don't need to be doing that. <laughs> they can they they can wait um you know oh um i need to be getting a second or third job why <laughs> you know I and i think people are willing to, to to focus on um you know this is what i like and i'm going to do this and a lot of the other stuff really doesn't matter i would jump off that and say that i think many people are having different conversations than they would have two months ago. So what we value as a society. Mm -hmm. um, and that these conversations are going to be really important. Mm -hmm. um, whether it's, you know, what, what should cities be prioritizing? Um, you know, what, what really makes people safer? Um, at a local level or at a national level, you know, what should we be prioritizing as a society um, is a thing that like people in my family are talking about. Uh, and I, I hope that's a conversation that keeps going after this, you know, what, what do we invest in and what do we care about um, and how do we show that? Really. Chelsea, you keep trying to jump in down there. <laughs> I just wanted to say, I love the curtness of like the Denver Homeless Out Loud crew. I love Deborah was so loud, and I love that you always tell it like it is. D hole's awesome. D hole forever. Sorry. <laughs> I love Don't it. apologize. I'm not, not running for office. <laughs> Don't apologize. We love it. Cool. Well, yeah, I think um, that's the. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, I think the uh, thing that I would say is very much like uh, what Chelsea had commented on, but I hope people keep this pace. I hope people. Um, stay in this healthy zone because I think a lot of our problems are because of the fact that people have been so pressed to be overly productive and just like these ideal or idealized versions of ourselves um, and because of that we can't ever stick to the reality of what we actually need to be doing because we are shooting for these idealistic versions um, so I'm really hoping that people stay in this pace and keep with the reality of who they are and what's currently in their body absolutely yeah and I think um, to add to the sentiments everyone's sharing, just quality over quantity has been a big thing for me that it's so easy to, to deal with the things that are right in your face or coming at you so fast. But I think this has been good for me to take a step back and not just say like, how am I spending my time, but what things are really worth my time. Um, so I think I'm hopefully learning some discernment there and in, in where I put my limited energy and time in life. Awesome. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think that even with all of our different perspectives, we're all kind of picking up on that similar theme there. That's pretty cool. Unless there's any more you know, I think. Benjamin, are you about to, about to start? Um, <laughs> We're, we get all this pressure from these politicians about opening everything up. And yet, when I talk to people who are caught up in those wheels, it doesn't seem like people are in a rush to get back to that. Yeah. Which, which is leading to some of the other questions like, after the pandemic finally passes, and it will, you know, we can choose to do it different. We're doing it different now. <laughs> So do we yeah, really want really to go does, back to that mess? <laughs> right. Like, it really does speak to what we are capable of changing as a society. Like, if they can put all of us on lockdown this fast, like, there's so many things that we've been waiting to see happen for centuries and decades, you know. I think it'll change our standard. 
you know, I think there's, there's a lot of uh, narratives that we've been told this is the only way we can do things. And I think the coronavirus is just revealing that that is just not true at all. And so I thought, mm-hmm. like everyone mentioned, that, you know, we can turn, turn this change into positive change, you know? Um, so how do we keep that moving forward then and not yeah. just get sucked mm-hmm. back up into normalcy again? Because it's going to be really hard to fight. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> I hope people just speak their truth. I mean, yeah. be adamant. Like, say, like, hey, why can't we just keep it like the way it was? And people are gonna be like, well, that's not how the way it works. It's like, yeah. can it though? Can it? Disrupt <laughs> it. Be disruptive. Yeah, I feel like we need to kind of hold each other accountable too, just to like remind remind each other, like, hey, it's okay to slow down. I don't. I don't think we'll ever go back to the old normal. I think it's kind of impossible. It's just fingers crossed that the new normal is. Is better, you know. You know, I think that's what we've got to keep our eyes on. I think something that we have the opportunity to do is because there's a lot of us who work for other people and they get rich, and we get tired. <laughs> um, if we just say we're not going back to work, <laughs> we're going to do something else with our time rather than make you rich. We get a lot of pressure from a lot of institutions. We're getting it now, you know. Um, we should be staying at home for another couple, at least three or four weeks, you know, and there's, there's governors and mayors all over the country going like, go out there, go out there, go out and make me some money. <laughs> we don't have to, if we don't want to, um, you know, and I've heard some things like, you know, there's places where they said they're opening up, but people aren't going out. Yeah. You don't have to. Yeah, I think uh, even even when the quarantine ends, you know, people's behavior is kind of irre- irre- uh, irreversibly changed. I'm just curious to see what it's going to be. Um, so I think, thank you so much for everyone, for all our guests for showing up tonight and giving us your time. You know, we really appreciate it. Um, thank you so much. And so does uh, Danny, do you want to like speak a few words about upcoming Soul Stories events or Kristen or? Yeah. Um... Well, Chelsea and I are going to be continuing our live stream. Um, and we'll be doing a live stream every Thursday through Soul Stories. And also, I just want to like, to all of our guests, like, this is a really thoughtful conversation. Um, I have a lot to reflect on. And if you guys can like post things on the page after for like ways we can support Denver Homeless Out Loud, Franklin mentioned Mercury Cafe, um, and other spaces and other artists and the scientists. Um, Hopefully Soul Stories can be a space where we can give platform to these other other entities in the city that we can support. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much, everyone. This was this was a really great conversation. It was, it was really informative to just hear about others' experiences and worlds that I wouldn't otherwise know about. Um, so thanks for being part of this. I think it was really special. And thanks to all the viewers. Yeah, that's, I think that's about it. <laughs> Thanks for having us. Thank All you. Right. Bye, Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.